Father, we bless you. We thank you, God, for the ushers, the deacons, the choir, Yet. And they just being themselves. 
some of them are happy, smiling. Some of them are thinking about the next party that they're going to go to. Some of them are thinking about getting that bag. Uh, and, 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 I don't know. So, so that means getting that money. <laughs> but some, some of them, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm helping y'all a little bit. Some young, young sisters, they, they know what to get the bag is. It's getting the money. So they think about getting the money. The whole life is all about money and what money can buy. That's on this side. Now this, this side, folks supposed to be thinking about doing the will of God. Now, if this side had flashlights, the light would represent the light that they have on the inside of them that is supposed to shine on the outside. Now, the one thing about it is if they had lights on this side, all of them got a light. And all of them cut their light on. You've heard me say it before. It doesn't really help anything because they already have light. Where their light is needed is over this side. I'm sorry to say, but for first of illustration only, you're in the darkness even though you have a light over you because you don't have Christ yet. And so you're in the darkness. You don't know the light. You haven't accepted the light. And you don't walk in the light, nor do you have a light to shine. Because you are still in darkness. What is supposed to happen is, and, and, and there may be some controversy about this, because Paul gives some instructions. I'm just going to paraphrase it. He says that, you know, there's some fornicators over here. There's some cheaters over here. There's some distortioners over here. There's a bunch of sinners over here. And, and Paul would suggest to the Europeans that he wrote a letter to that they that who are believers keep themselves distanced from those type of people. That's, that's what Paul writes to the Europeans. You know, he says that those who think of doing such things, all right, are wrong. I'm not just not paraphrasing because I'm one of our Bible scholars to say he misquoted. But but the gist of it is, he says, stay away from them. You don't want them to influence you. But Jesus says, all right. What Jesus says is that you are the salt and the light, and a light that is not set up on a hill and covered up. Because it can't give light. It's, it's open so that it can provide light to those who are in darkness. Now let me get through this real quick because this will take too long of the illustration. This group are born again believers. What you're supposed to do, you come together and get strength from each other. And then what you're supposed to do, uh, Sister Henry, if you don't mind me troubling you with you get up from this side and go sit amongst the folks over here in the dark. Now, now notice her bright, sunshiny yellow dress on the outside. If you would take that as a representation of what's on the inside, she has brought some light into the dark. Now, the darkness may not accept the light, but they will see the light. They will be benefited by the light. And she will be a catalyst to bring them to the light because they think it's her, but she will tell them that it's not her, but it is the Lord God Jesus that is in her that comes out on the outside. And oftentimes they will ask questions that will lead to the believer saying that, oh, I couldn't do this by myself. I would be just like you. But I have some help on the inside. And what we're supposed to do is after we come and get strength and get fueled up, then we go out. Uh, Sister Chad, Chad, would you mind 
going to maybe go back to the back here on this side. They say, well, we you know you can give us exercise today. <laughs> Thank you. I, I did that because mostly this side is seniors. And, and some of them say, Rev, you know we got bad knees. So I was thinking about you. All right, this is started. So I was thinking about you. So there we have some bones that we need to put meat on. And I want you to think about that as we do a brief exposition of John 1. 1 through 17, using for a subject or a title, whatever you want to call it, a thesis. Rick would say that if I had a thesis, I should have an anti-thesis. We've talked about that. I don't always have an anti-thesis. But look at the neighbor and say, you have a call to do it. Uh, the person that said that to you, I want you to look back at the person. The person that received it, I want you to look at the person that sent it and say, thank you very much. But you also have, you also have a, call a call to do. So we had you have, but the, the, the message is a call to do. Each of us have a call to do. I know some folks are already trying to figure out how does he get a call to duty out of first of, of the first chapter of John, verses one through seventeen. And I'm going to stick with me. You're going to find out. Those who have joined the military outside of the air and national guard, upon enlistment, they must take. And oath. And when they take that oath, they are asked to raise their right hand. For it is a binding oath. It's not like an oath that you take for a sorority or a fraternity. It's not like the oath that you take for the Masonics or for the Shriners. It's not like an oath that you take for the Elks or any other social organization. It is a legal binding oath. You are obligated by law to carry out this oath. Regardless of whether you intend to keep it. If you have other reasons for joining the military, this oath for those of us who have taken it is a serious event in our lives. This oath says, I and you will state your name. It's given by an officer that is in the active military. And that officer say, repeat after me. And he says, I. And you state your name. And then you say, do something, swear or affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States. And the orders of the officers appointed over me. Whether I like them or not, I'm just adding that in. Uh, whether it's Donald Trump or somebody else, I'm just adding that in. I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of officers appointed over me according to regulation and the uniform code of military justice. In other words, I take an oath that I will subject myself not only to the laws of the land, but to the laws of military justice, and that I will follow the regulations of the military for which I am joined. So help 
me God. Before any military person can begin to serve, before they begin any type of training, before they are authorized to call themselves a soldier, a sailor, an airman, or a marine, or a national, uh, a coast guard, they must take the oath to answer their call to do. For the Air National Guard and the National Guard, their oath is similar with the exception that they add in the governor of the state and the name of the state for which they are a National Guard for because they answer to the governor. But more importantly, they still answer to the President of the United States. And they still have officers appointed above them. The reason I read that is that as we get into this scripture, we're going to find that in order to be a soldier in the army of the Lord, there is an oath that we take. And after we take that oath, there is a call to do. No soldier, airman, sailor, or marine or other military person will have a successful enlistment or successful career if after the oath they do absolutely nothing. Rick, what I'm saying is that I don't understand why certain people can say that they're in the army of the Lord. And week after week after week after week, all they do is nothing. And then there's another group that all they do is complain about the nothing that other people do while they're doing absolutely nothing but Complain. Uh, but as military men, did you never, we know that those two group of people will not last in the military. You will be put out as being unsuitable for service. Now imagine if God. started pointing out folks in the church that were unsuitable for service. I think he would have to say chosen, but unsuitable. Saved, but unsuitable. Name is written in the Lamb Book of Life. Will it? But unsuitable. Using my spiritual imagination, sister Newsom, I, I believe that there might even be a section in heaven for those who were saved but unsuitable. I, I can't say that it is when I've been to heaven and John uh, didn't tell us that there was a section in the, the levels of heaven that he saw, he just let us know that there were different levels. But a statement that Jesus made when he was praying, what is the Lord's Prayer? Not your model prayer. When he prayed for every new born again believer that will ever exist. And he made a statement 
to the Father that he has not lost none, save the son of prediction. Which Jonas would lead me to believe that if he hadn't lost any then, he ain't lost any now. Which means that to our dislike that you would have some who were saved but unsuitable for service. Simply because they wouldn't do nothing. But how can you have a call to duty and know that you're doing nothing and that you're getting something just by the grace and the mercy of God. Not that we can pay for what Jesus did, but it's, it's, it's that you have no gratitude, you have no appreciation. It has not resonated in your mind, spirit, or body to the point that you want to show your appreciation. And so you feel that even though John, I mean John 1, chapter 1. It starts out a little strange, Sister Jasmine, because it resonates with Genesis. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Logos. Uh, Jay, the problem that we might have with this is that if we apply our American definition of word, it's, it's something that we speak and not something that we see. The personification in the passage says that the word is living and was with God in the beginning which means that the word has always been. But the word that is with God is also separate from God in order for it to be with God. But understand that the word was also God. That's, is that what your Bible says? All right, well, make sure you follow me. So the word was living. The word was with God in the beginning, but the word was separate from God, but the word was God. And when we get into understanding the Trinity, then we can try to make sense of it. Uh, but Sister Janice, the truth is that our minds, our human minds, really can't comprehend the essence of what the scripture is saying. And so we will accept that the Trinity, that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are separate entities, but they are all one. And we will simply accept that God is God and God can do anything, and because he can't do anything, if he wants to make a separation and call it separate, but call it the same, that he can. But the truth is, Sister Williams, that we truly don't really understand people will say it's kind of like a shoe that has a soul, a tongue, and, and, and whatever else, but uh, you cannot use a shoe as an analogy of what God is. I think the closest analogy we can use, Rick, is that we are fathers, we are husbands, and we have siblings, and so we are a sibling of other siblings. In each office, it is different. I don't treat my children the same way that I treat my wife. And I don't treat my wife and my children the same way that I treat my siblings. But I am a husband to my wife, which is a separate office of who I am. I am a father to my children, which is a separate office of who I am to my siblings, but I am a brother to each one of my siblings. And so
so it's three separate offices, but it's still the same person. The difference is that I can be a good father and a good sibling, but an awful and terrible husband. I can be a good husband and a terrible father and a terrible sibling. The thing is with God that he is good no matter what state that he is in. And so we go on to say that he was in the beginning with God. And now it makes a change. The English teacher would say that there should be a new paragraph because the language and the focus changes. The language first is on Jesus, as we know who is the word, and I'll show you that later. But John is not saying that now. John is writing this. And John is not saying what Jesus said. John is telling us who Jesus is and establishing his beginning and his association with God. And so now in verse number three, he says, all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. Uh, Deacon Arthur, what that's saying is that in the book of Genesis when we hear that on the first day God created and on the second day God created and on the third through the sixth day God created and God looked at what he had created and he said that it was good and on the seventh day he rested from his labor. What the writer is saying that when it says God in a synonymous with Jesus was right there when it all was being made and without Jesus it would not have been made. Although Jesus has not been introduced to the world yet, Jesus has not been introduced to Adam because God walked with Adam. Yes. Are you following? Yes. He goes on to say, in him was life. Now I'm going to pause right there to say him because we need to fully understand it. In him was life. The beginner Bible student might only attribute life as we know it to being in him. And while that is true, the statement is more significant, Nicole, than just life on earth. Because life on earth begins and ends. The life of your soul does not have an ending. And so when Jesus says that in him is abundance life. Everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Life is in the son Jesus. From the very beginning. And so when we understand that we can then process the call to duty because Christ was there from the beginning and he enables us to be soldiers on the battlefield for the Lord. He says, in him was life and the life was the light of men. Sister Elizabeth just reading that, it sounds good. But if we take it and look at it through Genesis again, for which is the Old Testament or the law of reference, when God created Adam, put Adam to sleep, 
performed the operation on him, opened him up, took a rib out, closed him up without stitches, took that rib and formed a woman, breathed the breath of life in the woman, presented the woman to Adam after he woke Adam up. How then can John proclaim that in him was life and the life was light of me? He would not be born for thousands and thousands of years. Matter of fact, just a little bit over. 2,000 years ago. But it is proclaimed. And he validated that he is the light and the light of me. And so, Sister Martha, if he is the light, and he is in us, that means the light is in us. And if he was the light of men, then we are to be on the battlefield the light of men. And I would submit to you, Mr. Deborah, that we have a call to duty to be the light. Not just carry the light, but be the light. Which means that we have to do something with the light. We have to give acknowledgement to the light. And we have to take the light when there is darkness. Sister Francine, I know that can be uncomfortable. around negative people. Right. A lot of people with darkness are negative people. Yes. They just see no reason for living. Mm -hmm. Everything is woe is me. Is me. Right. If it's not the man on their case mm -hmm. that's in the cars that have sirens and flashing lights, then it's the man that's on their job. If it's not the man on their job or the man in the car with the sirens and the lights, it's the man that calls himself their dad and has never been in their life. Or the man that calls himself dad that is not a good father. It's always somebody and never them. Who wants to be around that type of person? Who wants to keep hearing all of that negative? You just want to look at them, Sister Henrietta, and say, why don't you just die? <laughs> but that wouldn't be good life. <laughs> because Jesus came and gave you life so that you could be light that they might live. And as hard as it may seem, Sister Christina, we have what they need and we're supposed to share it with them. We have to turn their negativity around and show them where they have hope. May not be able to begin in one area, but that's what our job is. Some plant, some water, but God gives the increase. And I haven't even gotten to the sermon and I got to go. He says that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Or what it's saying is that the darkness did not overcome it. And so what he's saying is that Jesus came in the form of a man. And he shined among men who 
are in the darkness. And this is inclusive for women. So he shined among people who were in darkness, but they did not overcome the darkness because they didn't comprehend that he was the light. The light. Now, <coughs> tomorrow that is a hard concept to understand. Because how can you go in real darkness and shine a light and there not be light? See, that's because what light does. Light eradicates darkness. This room is not dark. Completely. And so the lights that are on are not essential. The light from the sun is shining through these stained glass windows, so it is diffused, but it's still enough to put light in the building, and with that amount of light, you can still see. And so the lights are still not essential. The lights only become essential when it becomes pitch black. Complete darkness. And then you can strike a match. And that light will put light and eradicate the darkness. And that's when light becomes essential. So some, some folks still ain't figured out what I'm preaching about. A call to do. Even though it may appear that the light in the world is light, the real light that the scripture is talking about is the light in a man or in a woman. And when they have not accepted the light on the inside, which you can't see, then they are still in darkness. And it's when you come to them and let what's on the inside of you shine on the outside. That they recognize that you have something on the inside that they don't have on the inside. That they don't understand that they would like to have. They would like to understand how it is that you can get cussed out week after week after week on your job. And you can get looked over for promotion year after year after year on your job. And you still come in with a smile. Jesus does 
the necessity of Jesus for man. But in reference to the passage and in reference to the sermon, he establishes one who our commander in chief is and why we are serving in his army. You see, if you don't know why you're serving in the army of the Lord, that's a good reason for you not to do nothing in the army of the Lord. If you don't realize who your commander in chief is, and you think that you are the commander in chief of your life, or your husband, or your wife, or your mom, or your dad, or whoever it is that you have to go to and get advice for every decision that you're going to make, then that's a good reason for you to be in service, but not fit for service. And so John establishes why we have a call to duty, who we are to answer to, who establishes the laws, who establishes the punishment, the justice, and what we're on the battlefield for. Exodus 33, 19 and 20 says, and he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. My Bible scholar knows that this is a discourse between God and Moses. And God told Moses to go to a certain place and he will allow him to see his backside because he could not see him face to face. But there is a question, Sister Newsom, that has to come to mind to Bible scholars that have read in the book of Genesis that God walked with Adam and God talked with Adam. And when Adam see God face to face, yes. and did he live?
I mean, even Uncle Sam gives you at least 30 days per year. And what pay you for? Sister Joe Nash, you know that? They're paying for 30 days to leave. But Jesus says, your pay is late. So you don't get no leave right now. I just thought I'd throw that in. John 5, 37 says, and the Father himself, Jesus says this, and the Father himself which has sent me have borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard at any time nor seen his shape. And he was talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the leaders at the time that he was ministering. Think about that, Jay. These folk claim to be messengers of God. Jesus comes and says, you have not heard from him. You have not heard his voice. Neither have you seen his shape. James, the question is, if they haven't heard from him or seen his shape, who were they representing? Themselves. And some say, well, why are you talking about them like that, Rev? Because some of us still do the exact same thing. Now, <coughs> This was the apostolic church that I grew up in. Sister Aiden, I would keep preaching. And nobody would leave. And folks would keep taking notes until I finished. But since this is not the apostolic church that I grew up in. And this is not none of the Church of God and Christ <coughs> churches that I attended. Nor is it a non-denominational holiness church that I may have been a part of. We're going to have to take a back then. Come back to the same bad channel <laughs> at the same bad time on next week. And I will pick up this call to do it. But I'm asking you to take notes. Some of you say, I'll go back and watch it on Facebook. That's good. But I want you to take note some kind of way. Because there's really no sense in me or any preacher coming Sunday after Sunday just to entertain you. And for you to leave out in the same spiritual shape that you came in. At some point, we ought to get thirsty and hungry and unsatisfied with the amount of the words that we give it. So as you can see, there has been a shift in the way that I preach. There's a lot less entertainment, which for some of you translated to being more. And I will submit to you it's only boring because you haven't got in the world. You haven't become infatuated with the world. And can I tell you, I know it's one o'clock, and I'll give you about five minutes. Can I tell you this? The love affair 
with God is like no other love affair that you have ever had. Can I tell you that the essence at its highest height that you have experienced in a relationship and I'm going to say something now somebody will say, oh no he didn't go even by yourself does not compare to what God would allow you to experience in his world. Sister Lucy, it makes you sing when you don't want to sing. Jane makes you smile and be nice to folk that you don't want to be nice to. Oh, yes. Johnny makes you stay with people. That you want to dismiss. This all we talk to the love of what you think. Are unlovable. It's the word. Anybody like to read fiction? Any fiction readers? No? Fiction readers. Any sci-fi readers? Those who like to read sci-fi. You like to read everything. Instructions. And your instructions, 
your battle plans, your war strategies, the war room, the situation room. It's all in the Bible. Every situation that you could come up against, how to handle it, how it was handled correctly, how it was handled incorrectly, it's in the Word. The word. And Sister Jacob, I ain't called you yet. I'm going to call you now. So you say he ain't called everybody but me, Brother Bernard. So Bernard, Sister Jacob, Backside of the children can't come back. But God will 
with hashtags except somebody being contacted. And finally, this is my, my greatest and, my, and the best invitation that I like to give. Those are good, but people gonna tell when they excited. And I've grown past being the type of preacher that believes in my preaching to cause the people to accept God. Most of the time, they haven't figured it out before they got to church. The seed had already been planted, all the work had been done, and, and they were ready. So I'm, I'm mature enough to know that, that I'm not going to change that. But what I get excited about is if you would like to become.